Um, so I'm going to talk about the limits uh, of diffusion models for decision making. Why would you care about this? Well, diffusion models have crystallized themselves as a go-to model in systems neuroscience, in decision neuroscience, and they turned out, excuse me? Use the mic a bit, so. Okay. And they turned out to um, fit a lot of behavior really, really well. Uh, what I want to ask today is, are they actually meeting the ecological demands of natural behavior? So I will argue, no, they don't. Uh, but I will also try to convince you that in most cases, that doesn't actually matter because they're still good enough. Um, all right, so if we talk about diffusion models, um, we need to talk about the speed accuracy trade-off. And that's a very common occurrence in everyday decision making. If you, for example, go uh, to dinner in Breckenridge, you need to cross the road, get bad visibility, you want to make sure it's safe to cross the road, so you look left, right, accumulate evidence about the environment, and at some point you decide, okay, I'm confident enough that I can actually cross the road, and then I do so. Uh, a similar pattern happens in the animal kingdom, for example, if a fox is hunting for animals that are covered under the snow. They first want to have auditory information about the location of the prey, and once they're certain enough that there is a prey that, they, that is worth hunting, uh, then they will initiate the jump. So in both cases, uh, we have these two stages, where at the first stage, you're basically accumulating evidence up until a certain point of confidence, and then you would initiate a uh, decision. So this leads very naturally to what's known as the speed accuracy trade-off, where on one side, uh, you have very fast choices. They tend to be inaccurate because you don't have a lot of evidence to make these choices. Uh, but they also come at the low cost of accumulating evidence, which might be attention, loss of time, and so on. Uh, on the other side, you've got slow choices, where, which are based on potentially a lot of evidence. They might be very accurate, but they also come at a high cost. And the trade-off is basically figuring out where on this axis we should be. And it turns out uh, that diffusion models are very good at actually balancing this trade-off, so I'm just giving a very short intro in the next few slides, this is just an overview, because they can actually model choices pretty well, also stochasticity in choices, uh, also model the associated decision time, not just in the mean, but also as a distribution across uh, repeated uh, trials, and they also seem to reflect something that's going on in the brain. Uh, so they could also act as a model for uh, neural mechanisms. And what I want to ask today in my talk is, do diffusion models indeed describe the underlying strategy? Um, and the reason why I get to this question is because under many natural circumstances, they're actually suboptimal. And then that poses the question, well, are they nonetheless just good enough that this is actually the strategy that animals and humans are using? Or are we looking uh, uh, at overly simple experiments where more complex strategies actually look like diffusion models? So most of my talk I will spend on uh, this part here, where I talk about when they're optimal and when they're suboptimal, and then I'll come back to these two questions at the very end. Uh, so I should emphasize, if anything's unclear, please ask immediately. I want to make sure that everything's on the same page. Okay. Um, so in the lab, usually uh, such decisions are not, um, um, not uh, tested by sending people across the road. Usually what's happening is uh, that you have more restricted uh, Setups and a very popular one that I use as an example for the next few slides is the random dot motion task that many of you might know. Uh, you, in this task, you've got a set of dots that are mostly moving randomly, a subset of which, which is known as the coherence, is moving in one of the two target directions, in this case, left and right. Uh, in this example, uh, the dots are moving with a high coherence, so a large fraction of dots moving in one of the target directions. So in this case, it's pretty, well, maybe not so clear, but in this case, they're actually moving towards the right. Uh, if you lower the coherence, you can make the decision actually harder. Uh, so let's just look at this. So who thinks it's left? Who thinks it's right? Not bad. Uh, it is actually left, uh, but it's pretty hard to see in a projector. Um, all right, uh, standard behavior uh, looks like this. So if you increase coherence on the horizontal axis, you find that the proportion of correctly identifying uh, the underlying uh, motion, uh, target direction increases from zero to one. Uh, from one half to one, uh, and the response time uh, generally drops. And this is a human uh, subject that's basically performing this kind of task, but a uh, similar pattern also emerged in a lot of uh, other decisions and also for animals. Now, how do diffusion models actually, uh, how are they used to model these kind of behaviors? Well, the idea is that as input, you get uh, um, momentary evidence about the underlying motion direction. Here I'm just illustrating this uh, by two pools of neurons. One's basically coding uh, for motion in one direction, the other one's coding for motion in the other direction. And the idea is that you basically subtract the information that they provide 
to have an overall net information that basically comes into the model. But this is then accumulated over time and forms a drifting and diffusing particle. Uh, once this particle hits one of the two boundaries, a decision is triggered. So the particle is usually well described by a, a Wiener process that I'm showing you here uh, with a drift on top of this. A single, a single example in a trial could look like that. So this would now be the trajectory of the particle that's moving through space and time. In this case, uh, you would choose the right boundary at this particular time. Um, and it's actually the correct choice because the drift is actually upwards. The drift is not something that's usually observed by a decision maker. If you do this multiple times, because you've got stochasticity in the information and therefore uncertainty, you get stochasticity in the choice times, so which is basically different times at which you hit the boundary, but you also get stochasticity in the choices because sometimes you hit the wrong lower boundary in this particular case. In the simplest case, uh, such models have three parameters, uh, and then you can go back to behavior, and you can adjust these parameters to fit that behavior, and those are the fits uh, you would see. So you can see uh, these models fit pretty well, both the proportion correct and uh, the reaction times as well, with changing coherence. Now, this doesn't only work well for diffusion models, uh, for, sorry, random dot motion task, it also works well uh, for a lot of fast, so fairly low time, uh, short time scale, single stage, single stage decisions, sorry, um, like one, uh, word, non-word judgments, uh, uh, numerosity judgments, or recognition memory. So the question I want to ask is why does such a simple mechanism actually work so well? Why does it, why does it describe behavior so well? And how does it relate to the optimal strategy? So to talk about the optimal strategy, we need to introduce a little bit more formalism. So let's assume we have an underlying latent state that is unobserved by the decision maker, which can be in this case just one or minus one. So this would be rightward motion, leftward motion. Um, the decision maker observes a noisy version of that state at any point in time, uh, which I basically just call the noisy momentary evidence, uh, which is just a noisy version of the set. The delta t's you can ignore, they're just basically to make the whole thing work in continuous time. And the way to think about the problem now is basically we assume that uh, we observe samples from one of the two <coughs> distributions and we need to figure out which distribution is it. So do the samples come from the uh, orange distribution or from the blue distribution? Um, now, the optimal way to solve this particular problem is just to apply Bayes' rule. So we want to know what is the best belief about the motion being, in this case, rightwards, given all the samples I've observed so far. And it turns out that this is actually very simple. It turns out that the posterior belief is just a function of this accumulated evidence on the horizontal axis, which is just the sum of all the samples that you observe. And if the sum of these samples is zero, then you're completely undecided. You basically have no information to make a choice. If it uh, has a large positive value, you're fairly certain that the motion is rightwards. If it has a large negative value, you're very certain that the motion is leftwards. Uh, the important thing uh, that you should focus on is that the only thing you actually need to keep track of is the accumulated evidence to basically make that choice, right? So those are the sufficient statistics that completely determine our belief about one of the two motion directions being the true underlying one. Um, so how is this linked to diffusion models? Well, if you reduce the time steps uh, to very, very small, this basically is described by a diffusion model with a drift. And that tells us under, this, under these circumstances, evidence accumulation actually corresponds to a drifting uh, Wiener process. So that's like in diffusion models. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the sign of x actually allows us to make the decisions, uh, because if it's positive, then we believe that rightwards is more likely than leftwards. If it's negative, it's the other way around. So it basically means the decisions are optimal just by looking at the sign, which then justifies the two boundaries you put on the drifting and diffusing particle. Um, so the bottom line here is that under very simple assumptions that I've made here, diffusion models perform optimal evidence accumulation. Now, I should emphasize here those are extremely simple assumptions, and they are, under I think almost all conditions, overly simplistic. So let me relax those a little bit, and the way I'm going to relax them now is basically to say we actually don't know the difficulty of the trial. And the difficulty of the trial is in this case controlled by the distance between these two distributions. Because if you put them far apart, then a few samples of the distribution allow you very easily to tell is it the orange or the blue distribution. If you put them close together, then it's very hard to tell them apart. And in natural uh, problems, usually you don't know a priori if you have a, an easy or a hard choice to make. You don't know how much evidence you get per unit time. Uh, so how can we change the question to basically take this into account? Well, rather than discriminating between two distributions, what we instead do is we say, well, what's the mean of the distribution that we're drawing the samples from? And is that mean larger than zero or smaller than zero? Uh, 
it's basically the same question, just reformulated, uh, restated. Um, and this basically allows us to solve the whole problem again by uh, Bayesian, uh, by Bayes rule, computing the posterior. It looks very similar as before, so you again compute the posterior belief, which is a function of the accumulated evidence. But the only thing that changes is now that uh, it's not the accumulated evidence only, not the x only, but it's actually normalized by time. So now there's a sufficient statistics change, and this is important. So now basically the sufficient statistics, which is the thing you need to keep track of to accumulate evidence, is not just uh, the particle location, it's also time. Is that a problem for diffusion models? Well, not really, because in diffusion models, we do have particle location, we track that, but we also track time, because they unroll over time. So we can, can perform optimal evidence accumulation even under these particular circumstances. And basically, these principles now allow us to generalize a little bit, uh, because you can now show that diffusion models are basically optimal if they represent and bounce the sufficient statistics of the particular problem you want to apply them to. Uh, in the previous case, when the evidence reliability was constant, the sufficient statistics were just the particle location, which is represented in diffusion models. Uh, if it varies across trials, but remains constant within trials, then it's uh, particle location and time, again, both of which are represented by diffusion models. So my focus here was mostly on evidence accumulation. It is, it can be shown by a slightly more complicated argument, that this is also sufficient to stop at an optimal time. So basically to really trade off perfectly the speed and the accuracy of the decision. Uh, as I said, it's a bit more complicated. I can talk about it afterwards in the break if you want to. Um, so I've gone through these two examples, uh, but the whole thing can still be a bit more generalized. So we've also shown previously that the whole thing also works in value-based decisions rather than the perceptual decisions I was talking about before, where you basically need to decide between wanting to consume, let's say, an orange or a chocolate cake under certain conditions. Uh, it also works if the evidence reliability varies within a trial if it does so in a knowing way, because then the only thing you need to do is rescale time. Uh, it's a bit of a variant, but you still only need to these two dimensions that you usually use in diffusion models. So now this allows us to refine our question a little bit from when are diffusion models so optimal to Basically, under which circumstances do we need to track more sufficient statistics than the two that diffusion models actually track? Because then diffusion models become optimal. All right, so I'm going to go through a few examples to show you where this actually is the case. Uh, the first one would be, okay, let's assume you're driving through fog and you need to decide if the road is safe or not safe. And the critical thing here is that the fog might actually change. So it might come in patches, uh, and that changes the reliability in an unpredictable way. And we've shown that under these circumstances, um, you need to track uh, at least the current belief about safe and not safe, and at the same time, the estimate of the current reliability of the evidence. That's just a requirement to actually perform the task optimally. Uh, here is just a simple example. So let's assume we have a low reliability in the beginning, and then it goes to a high reliability uh, at a later stage. Then uh, the optimal way to solve this, uh, which we've shown in this paper, is that basically now you accumulate evidence in this two-dimensional space of belief and reliability, you don't see time anymore, this requires uh, a separate axis. But basically, this is a trajectory that unrolls over time from low reliability with changing belief to high reliability. At some point, you'll hit the boundary here and you basically trigger a choice. If you map this down to a single dimension where you basically only have a boundary on the belief, then essentially what you get is a boundary height that needs to vary according to the current estimate of the reliability. Right, so basically, bottom line here is, you need to have a high dimensional space to actually solve the problem uh, optimally. Uh, another example is uh, value-based decision making. So previously I said, well, you can actually solve this with diffusion models, but the caveat is only under very specific assumptions. So here the assumption is that we need to estimate the value of this item and that item and basically figure out which one has the higher subjective value to us. Uh, previously we've shown that if the expected utility is linear in value, so basically, the thing you assume to get uh, once you consume that item is basically linear in your value estimate, then um, the optimal strategy is basically to have two boundaries in the space of value estimates of the two items, and those are parallel to each other. In between, you would wait and accumu accumulate more evidence. This particular becomes irrelevant for actually making choices, so the only thing we need to care about is this particular direction. So we can map the whole problem again to a one-dimensional problem. And then basically means the fusion models are again optimal. Now it turns out that once the expected utility is nonlinear in value, then these decision boundaries are not parallel anymore. Which basically means if you then 
use only a single direction that you've used before, you perform suboptimal choices, right? And the same thing has shown actually if you have temporal discounting, which seems to be the case in, in most uh, humans and animals. So in this case, uh, also you cannot just use a simple diffusion model. The strategy needs to be more complicated to actually make optimal choices in this case. So one last example I want to go through is um, decision-making with an attentional bottleneck. Um, so uh, usually in this case, uh, we always assume that you have perfect processing capabilities, but it could be that if you look one item, you actually can't really process the other item and so on. So if we have this attentional bottleneck, we basically introduce an additional action, which is when do we switch attention from one item to the other. And it turns out that in this particular case, the actual optimal policy space becomes four-dimensional. I'm showing you here a three-dimensional subsection stereoff, but there is actually, there are two of those. So basically this is the fourth dimension here. And without explaining all the details, the only thing I want you to notice is that basically now you get different regions within this space of sufficient statistics. One is you wait to accumulate more evidence. Another one is you switch to the other item. And the third one is uh, you basically make one of the two choices, right? And a simple walkthrough would be, well, you start with one of those two policies that corresponds to attending to the different item. You accumulate evidence, you reach an area where you switch, you basically move to the other policy. You accumulate more evidence, you switch again, and then you accumulate more evidence and you basically make a choice. And it turns out that this model, which is also the optimal model under particular circumstances, explains behavior fairly well. Uh, so this is an example where um, they had, um, human subjects choose between uh, two consumer items and uh, monitored fixations, but allowed free fixations, and we just used fixations as a proxy for attention. Um, and what they showed in this paper is that the choices are actually uh, biased by how much people attend on the different items. Um, so this would be a psychometric curve uh, over the value difference of choosing one particular item. And it turns out uh, that it's biased by the last fixation, which are the two different lines. So if you fixate the item, you're more likely to actually choose it in the end. Uh, and it turns out that it's also biased by the overall fixation on a particular item, not just the last one. And we replicate both of those effects in our model and a lot of other ones. So the bottom line of these three examples is that uh, diffusion models actually become unsuitable in the optimal sense uh, once we move to more realistic decisions. Um, so to come back to the original question, why diffusion models actually still work so well? Well, it turns out uh, sufficient statistics, if sufficient statistics are particle location and time, then yes, they perform optimal evidence and uh, optimal evidence accumulation and optimal step stopping. Um, but they become suboptimal for more complex natural problems. So now I want to get back to the initial questions that I've asked. So the first one is, are they nonetheless good enough? So do we need to use actually these more complicated strategies uh, to achieve adequate performance, or could we instead use diffusion models and not perform much worse? Um, I'm not going to say much about the second one because uh, it turns out to be a very hard question. We have no good solutions to that so far. So I'm going to focus mostly on the first one for which we do actually have uh, answers. Um, so what do I mean with good enough? I already said, well, uh, formally we can say, um, if we build an optimal model for the task and we apply a diffusion model for the task as well, how much rewards do we lose? So we assume that the thing we want to actually maximize is our reward, rather than any other measure of optimal estimation and so on, because sometimes optimal estimation might not be required to actually achieve good rewards. Um, and I'll show you two examples. The first one is the one of varying evidence reliability, when you do not know how the, how the evidence is going to, uh, how the reliability is going to change in the future. And um, so what I'm showing you here is basically the performance loss of diffusion models at the top and another two-dimensional model at the bottom over different statistics of the environment. And statistics of the environment are here defined by statistics of how the reliability actually is assumed to change over time. So describing the properties of that process. Here at the bottom you have the mean reliability varying. Here you have the reliability variance varying. And across all of these different boxes, you've got the speed of change of the reliability varying. And you can see white basically at the top means that diffusion models perform almost as well as the optimal strategy, whereas uh, deep green here means that they have more than 50% reward loss. And what I want you to notice is that there are huge white areas here, which basically means that under a lot of different environmental statistics, you could use diffusion models which are much simpler and still perform really, really well. Right? 
So if this is actually, if those are actually the statistics of the environments we're operating in, it doesn't make sense to use more complex strategies because you don't really gain anything from that. Uh, a second example is the one of the attentional bottleneck, where we compared the model of the optimal, more complex four-dimensional strategy, uh, which is here shown. So this is the reward of that uh, particular model for particular parameter settings, uh, shown in red. And we compare this uh, to uh, what's known as the attention modulated diffusion model. It has some modification by attention, but it's still operating in this two-dimensional space of particle location and time. Um, and you can see when we plot this over different decision boundary heights, uh, which are not part of the optimal model here, that's why it doesn't vary actually, uh, you can see that we are, in terms of rewards, uh, under some, certain circumstances, we're actually really close to the optimal model uh, with a much, much simpler model. So here, I mean, just if you can't see from the back, this is a mean reward of uh, 5.4 roughly, and this is one of 5.6. So you really don't gain much if you use this really complicated strategy. So, the bottom line here is, uh, despite being suboptimal, diffusion models appear to be really good enough under many circumstances that we've tried. I can't, unfortunately, make uh, more general statements because, uh, because for each different scenario, you have different optimal models, and uh, I wouldn't know exactly how to generalize over the space rather than looking at very specific scenarios. Yes? Maybe I should bring this up afterwards. I think one interesting scenario to consider is what if your samples are not independent over time? Sensory systems very often have kind of slow correlations over time, meaning yeah. if you treat them as independent samples, you progressively learn less and less and less. I think that would be a very interesting case to uh, consider what the optimal policy is. Um, yes, so if you've got temporal correlations, I mean, you could, in theory, decorrelate them with a filter as you would uh, decorrelate, uh, let's say, fluorescent calcium traces over time. And then you can again use the same strategies, which are then again optimal. Uh, you can also do it the other way around. You can ask now if you, uh, if you sum, you, it becomes really complicated because then just summing up uh, evidence is not going to be the right thing to do anymore. So you need to use some other kind of filter. I think the changes should still be fairly minimal. They would usually operate at the input of diffusion models and then they still become optimal as far as I can tell. So you can still, um, I think you could still actually build fully optimal models even, even under these circumstances. Um, but this is, I mean, this is my last slide anyway, so I'm just going to summarize now. Uh, so I told you about uh, diffusion models that capture a wide range of behavior and also told you that they are optimal for tasks in which uh, the sufficient statistics uh, for accumulating evidence are particle location and time, but also showed you that uh, they're so optimal for many, and I would actually argue most natural tasks. Um, but nonetheless, they're frequently good enough. The question for me here is, uh, how universal is that property? Uh, and it's very, I think that's a very hard question to actually answer because it requires us to know the distribution of possible tasks that animals and humans actually need to solve. Um, and it could also be, nonetheless, uh, that what we observe is really just a reflection of simplistic experiments. It's also a bit harder to tell because, as I've told you, they actually perform really well. So telling uh, a, a complex strategy from a more simple strategy actually turns out to be a really hard task. Uh, with this, I'd like to wrap up. Uh, thank my lab and my collaborators, the people in bold contributed to the work that I was uh, presenting today, my funding sources, and I'm happy to take uh, more questions. Yeah, so, uh, yeah I, um, I think that's very interesting. And I wonder on the last point about them frequently being good enough, um, I wonder, could it actually even be stronger than that, where they could sometimes be, in a sense, optimal, even when they're suboptimal? Because they're a simpler model, and we know people are often assuming the environment's changing, so they'll have to be re-estimating the parameters of their model. So if you have a complex model, that will actually introduce noise to the parameter estimation. If you have a simpler model, even if it's wrong and biased, you may actually get more reward under those scenarios. So have you considered those situations? That, that's an excellent question, and this is something I've completely ignored in my talk. And uh, this is actually something I, I ran across in uh, one of, one of the, uh, it's a PNAS paper we published last year, where it turns out that a suboptimal strategy strictly outperforms an optimal strategy, which is, which we found really weird. So basically I spent, I think, two weeks debugging my code uh, because I thought this just can't be true because suboptimal is by definition worse than optimal. Uh, 
But it turns out that under a limited sample regime, which I think is basically something, under a limited data regime, uh, it could be that uh, because you're using a less complex model that is nonetheless close enough to optimal, uh, is more uh, efficient at actually using uh, the data, uh, basically fitting less parameters, and can then more rapidly actually outperform the optimal model, which is more complex but needs more data to actually perform well. So yeah, I think that's a really good point. So under these circumstances, yes, uh, a simpler mechanism that is, asymptotically speaking, not optimal, can actually outperform the sub uh, the optimal model. So maybe that's why sometimes humans might use a seemingly simple strategy, because they may be better. Sure. Yeah, yes. And I think that's something that has uh, been, well, it has certainly been underappreciated by me, because I didn't consider that uh, even, but uh, um, it's probably generally underappreciated, I agree. In the attention switching model and the ADDM, how are you comparing them? Because I, I was under the impression that you're actually switching between the sources of evidence that you're getting, but in this heuristic ADDM, are you not actually doing that? You're just looking at one evidence source the, the whole time? Yeah, I didn't or? give you enough information to yeah, understand all the details. details um, yeah. So, uh, I mean, the way I introduced this is I, uh, I introduced this by saying we're switching attention between the different items, but that's not actually what's going to happen. It's like when you're telling one item, we still assume you get some evidence from the other one. Okay. Right? And you can then basically ask uh, which is the parameter that best explains the behavior. So how much information do you get from the non intended item? That's the same that's happening in the ADDM. Does it make more sense? Does this somehow address your question? So there's still switching going on in the ADDM? Yes, there is. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the other thing about the ADDM is that it actually does not uh, allow you to tell when the switching is supposed to happen. They basically just put this in from the outside. They assume this goes into the decision-making system. And the ADDM only models evidence accumulation. It does not model when you're supposed to switch. I see. So Whereas our, our model does it. So that's a model where you didn't switch at all, you would do way worse. Yeah, yeah, yes, you would do way worse. Yes. Um, so in diffusion, the, the definition of the diffusion model as it's um, historically been described is it's basically a visual metaphor. And, and then and once you strip away the visual metaphor, then you, as you pointed out, it just becomes a statement about the sufficient statistics that you're allowed to use. And um, in a lot of the other models that you described, they had this, a similar flavor to the diffusion model in that there's some kind of like Langevin dynamics that hit a boundary, and then that switches the um, switches the, the regime of the dynamics. Is that it, once once you just say that that's now the space of options that we're going to call diffusion models, things with you know Langevin dynamics that hit boundaries and then change, does that now just capture all you know continuous Bayesian inference, or is what like what types of strategies lie outside that? now as the new definition of a, like a quote-unquote diffusion model? That's a good question. So I, I restricted myself to the historical definition of diffusion models, uh, also for the reason that this is the assumption that a lot of people make when they talk about diffusion models. I agree you can obviously generalize that space. Um, uh, once you do, then, um, then I should go back to, let me see. Uh, go back to this slide. So here I made this bold statement that basically as long as you uh, represent and bound your sufficient statistics, you can perform optimal decision making in a framework where we assume that you accumulate evidence first and then you decide to make a, a decision. And that is a general statement. So basically um, you just need to describe how your sufficient statistics evolve over time. Right? Most likely in, in many cases where you have some continuous spaces, then they will probably evolve in a, in a diffusion-like way. And as long as you bound your sufficient statistics in some way, you will be able to perform optimal speed accuracy trade-off. Right? This can actually be shown. Um, so yes, if you generalize to that particular space, then you capture a very wide range of possible tasks. But I deliberately just stayed with the very simple definition. Uh, perhaps one more question um, in the back. Excuse me, I didn't how, know. how do the diffusion models, how do you deal with one, one option being very heavily weighted against, you know, if you, if you go that way, it will be that leap, or, you know, yes. how, how do you... You mean, uh, if one is, let's say, high rewarded, the other one's very low rewarded? It's, it's the opposite of reward, right? It's punishment in a way. Well, negative reward. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm a theoretist. Yeah. Same thing. 
Um, yeah, I haven't introduced this, I assumed, uh, uh, symmetry in all cases. Uh, the only thing that would change, I mean, you can include this, the only thing that would change is you get asymmetric boundaries. Right? Uh, everything here I draw, drew was symmetric, but uh, it, it doesn't change the complexity really of the problem by, uh, other than shifting the boundaries. Okay, thanks, Jan. Thanks, thanks Jan. Okay, our next speaker would be uh, Song Ki from uh, Caltech. Do you want to do that? Decision making under threat.